So now we have Model 30 Ship 2 being rolled out. The Swedish yoke is still there, but it's down in the plane of the rotor, so we called it the Diamond Truss this time. And here are shots that were made later after much successful flying, uh, but they illustrate the control system. These were made for Bell's Bell Aircraft's standard public relations department. You'll see that this time we do have rudder pedals and we have a collective pitch in the conventional location. Although at first we merely had the pitch between the two seats and Floyd, when he flew from that left-hand seat, had to swap his hands. This we never uh, were successful with. And after Floyd had a near miss with it, we decided to add a second collective pitch lever for his left hand when he's in the left seat. We knew about Sikorsky flying their R-4 helicopter with only that one that you see here between the seats. But we never succeeded really in doing this. Now you notice that the bar didn't move up and down. We have a much better, more sophisticated design. There are the pedals which control the pitch of the tail rotor, and the tail rotor has been greatly lightened. We did have a fatigue failure of that particular tail rotor, but Floyd got it down okay. Now we also have a clutch at last. It consists of putting one of the ring gears in bearings and then a brake band around that, like a Model T Ford transmission. And then when you tightened the, the brake band, the ring gear was locked in place and power went to the rotor. Actually, we usually had to cheat and have an assistant throw an extra toggle uh, and actual positive lock, but it was a clutch at least. Now this machine, we did a great deal of flying. You can see the little Fram dampers there to look at vibration frequencies. Uh, it, many rescues and demonstration flights were made with this helicopter. Floyd picked two fishermen off the ice with it. They had gone out ice fishing and the uh, thaw had come and their truck had f uh, melted and disappeared and they were unable to get to shore, shore so he brought them in one at a time. They even wanted to bring their catch with them, but he wouldn't allow that. Uh, the ship also was used for rescues of uh, people in needing medical at attention in isolated farmhouses and so forth during severe weather. Now, at last, Larry Bell is going to get his ride. At about this time, uh, we felt rides could be given and uh, it's, it's early spring now of 1944, and uh, Larry has his ride. Correction, it may be late in uh, 43, just before winter. Now here's a demonstration indoors. This is the uh, first flight in the Western Hemisphere indoors of a helicopter. We knew that Fokker, the Fokker Achgelis helicopter, had flown in 1936 from Bremen to Berlin, and in 1937 it had hovered for a full hour indoors in the Deutschlandhalle in Berlin. But this is the first time in the Western Hemisphere. Floyd had some trouble with the dust, but he had practiced in the morning, and uh, the only th problem that he really had here was the searchlight. I think you can see uh, that he's trying to avoid looking ahead here and getting out of the light as fast as possible. We all uh, complain sometimes uh, in engineering circles about having to give demonstrations, but uh, we shouldn't because all I can say is twas ever thus. Even in those days, with our limited resources, we had to interrupt development programs in order to demonstrate. This was for the Civil Air Patrol uh, sort of uh, celebration. It's April of 1944. Now we go to July 4th, 1944, in Civic Stadium. And here is Ship 1, rebuilt and rechristened Ship 1A. Notice the tail rotor is up in the air, and the uh, rear wheel is no longer so robust. It's pushed forward so that Floyd is able to land in auto rotation in a flare. This is a celebration for defense plant workers in Buffalo Civic Stadium. You can see the 4th of July fireworks getting ready to go off right behind him there, but uh, luckily he didn't get too near them. Now, uh, after this 
demonstration, it was decided that we should do some professional flight testing with this helicopter. It was against Arthur Young's wishes. He wanted to go on with more radical development work, but Bell felt that uh, we should learn more about how to make actual measurements and flight tests and see what we have. Those two movie cameras there are below a 35 millimeter one and above is the is an ordinary 16 millimeter one giving the general view. The lower one focuses on the instruments. So we have a rather crude but effective uh, photo panel. At about this time we were visited by uh, a delegation from Curtis that had been invited by Larry Bell. One of the members of the delegation was a young engineer uh, by the name of E.J. Ducaye, who later became president of Bell Helicopter in Texas. Here's our voice communication. Of course, we didn't have telemetry or anything like that. And uh, Floyd is going to make climbs all the way to 5,000 feet, various air speeds, gross weights, RPM, and so forth, and also autorotative descents. Now, Arthur Young himself flew this helicopter in this configuration around the field. Unfortunately, we don't have a movie of it. I wish we did. But this is the helicopter that is now at the Smithsonian in Washington. Notice that the magnesium tail boom has been rebuilt also. Uh, so uh, Ship 1A is really a fairly complete vehicle. About this time, we decided that we should build a third helicopter. It would be a terrible shame not to incorporate the things we'd learned in the first two and try to make a product. But uh, Bell Management told us we were not to do this, that all products we were to be designed in the main engineering department. So nevertheless, we went ahead building a third helicopter, calling it a test bed on the grounds that we had to gather more data for the main engineering department, which was in fact true. And at first, we weren't aware of the fact that our third helicopter might possibly become a product. Now you're going to see the instrument panel here. And just to the left of Floyd's hand is the tachometer unwinding. So when the needles are split that way, it proves you're in auto rotation because the engine is then turning slower than the rotor. You can also see the altimeter unwinding there. The instrument above, surrounded by aluminum sheet, is merely the clock. You can see a rate of descent there, too. Now, here's a still from the 35 millimeter camera, typical of what gave us our data. And we got very reproducible, beautiful performance curves, which would hold up even today. The method of doing so was merely to take many points, which was, of course, uh, quite easy to accomplish with this simple equipment very little problems, very few problems with the instrumentation. Now here's a descent uh, toward the end of a uh, measurement from altitude. Uh, Floyd decided here to go back to the Gardenville plant. Of course, we no longer had to be towed along the road or anything. So he flies back to visit his friends who are still working on the project on the Model 30, Ship 3. Now, here they are waiting to watch him arrive. There's our friend, the furnace man. And here is the boy looking, uh, who made the blades and one of the machinists. The total number of people on the project never exceeded 32, although there was some attrition and uh, interchange. But that's all that we ever had working at any one time at Gardenville. Uh, about this time, we'd had a visit from Sikorsky in the form of the U.S. Coast Guard flying two R-6 helicopters. We interchanged rides with them. Uh, Arthur knew Igor Sikorsky well, greatly admired his work. Uh, he considered it uh, right in the line of the work already done by Fokke and Flettner in Germany, Breguet in France, Dascanio in Italy, and so forth. And. Uh, of course, his own work here at Gardenville. Notice the fuel tank is no longer on top. It's down below, and we are using a fuel pump. 
uh, that's also uh, one of the things that was new with Ship 1A. Now, in that group of people you see behind there, uh, eight of those people are still working in this year of 1977 in Bell Helicopter Textron in Texas. Now, Floyd uh, flies away from them there, and they go back to work after they say goodbye to him on Ship 3. Unfortunately, we have almost no shots of Model 30 Ship 3 because it was rather illegally constructed. It did, in fact, become a third helicopter, uh, although our orders were to build only the two. But here it is, and you'll see the four-wheel gear, the a uh, welded chrome molly steel sort of construction of the center frame. There's a basket holding the uh, transmission and many features that later became Model 47 of which 10,000 were built. The only thing really lacking is the bubble. There Larry Bell is getting a ride so Ship 3 is now sanctioned and about this time it was decided to make production drawings and actually uh, make a production helicopter along these lines, in spite of the fact that the main engineering had also been working already on somewhat larger helicopters. Notice that there's no floor there even, so that uh, if your shoe became unlaced and fell, you lost it forever. It was quite a thrill getting power off landings as a passenger in this machine. Here Larry Bell is getting another ride this time with Joe Mashman. Arthur Young developed the glass bubble and supervised the transition to castings, forgings, production drawings, and so forth. We built a production prototype, which on the 7th of March, 1946, received the world's first civilian certification, NC1H. These scenes show one of the early users of Model 47. Helicopter Air Service of Chicago is flying the mail under government contract using nine helicopters. Larry Bell had insisted on the tail boom being covered with fabric for cosmetic reasons, but this later turned out to be too much of a penalty for a strictly utility machine. Arthur Young's mechanical genius and Larry Bell's enthusiasm and vision have combined to produce the birth of the Bell helicopter.